Hiya, hello everybody. Um, I just wanted to start and welcome you all. Thank you for coming. I wanted to start with an acknowledgement of country. So we're meeting today um, on Wajak Nova Buja and very um, culturally significant uh, space. Um, and this is a space where a lot of us work and live. And I just wanted to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge it, the unbroken and continuing connection to country. And we're really privileged to be able to meet here today. Um, so with that, um, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Lucy Paparo, um, a NHMRC uh, Emerging Leadership Fellow at UWA. And just wanted to give a little bit of an intro to the event before I pass over to Professor Hall um, to introduce our esteemed speakers tonight. And start by saying about the foundation for this event. So it's a collaboration between the Public Policy Institute of UWA. So Director Paul McGinn over here. Hello everybody. <laughs> um, and organised by Claire Beenan and Margaret Lindley. And then also collaboration with the Forest Research Foundation, so Director James Avanatakis at the back, and um, organised by Jenny Pack out there as well. So this event and many like it are really a space to uh, have provocative thoughts, conversations, and ways to get together with everybody to you know share conversations. So hopefully you enjoy tonight. Um, and I wanted to then also just talk a little bit about the Forest Research Foundation. So here, this is Forest Hall. We have uh, forest uh, scholars, so PhD scholars and fellows that live here and work at the various universities across WA. So these are across all disciplines. It's not discipline specific. And we're actually really shifting to focus away from disciplines. So really seeing that uh, cross collaboration and not just sort of narrowly focusing on really niche definitions of what our field is. So I'm delighted to be able to welcome, I'm, as an alumni of the Forest Foundation, I'm also um, delighted to have a UWA alumnus here, um, Professor David Patterson. Um, and I'll pass over to Professor Paul in a moment. But I just wanted to firstly also just do some housekeeping. So uh, the bathrooms are just down the corridor and to the left if you need them. Tonight's event will be recorded um, and we'll have uh, the presentation followed by some Q&A and then we'll have um, further discussion over refreshments. So without further ado, uh, so I wanted to introduce uh, Professor Libby Hall um, who will introduce tonight's um, speaker. So Professor Hall is the head of the Ben Beal uh, Laboratory and this is the cardiovascular research um, laboratory at the University of Western Australia across the road. And she was recognised as internationally as the leading cardiovascular electrophysiologist and making significant contributions uh, to understanding the mechanisms of cardiac death and cardiomyopathy. So please welcome our moderator, Professor Hall. event hosted, as you heard, by the Forest Research Foundation and the UWA Public Policy Institute. It is a pleasure to be joining you this evening. You are in for a treat. I'm delighted to be moderating this evening's proceedings and introducing a good friend and academic colleague for nearly 20 years, Professor David Patterson. So before I introduce him, uh, let's talk about the mind. Most of us would agree that the mind can be a powerful influence over the body. Our emotional, psychological and uh, social well-being affects how we think, feel and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others and make healthy choices. In any year in Australia, it's estimated that one in five people aged between 16 to 85 will experience a mental disorder. The 2020 Productivity Commission report estimates that um, estimates that mental illness has cost Australia $220 billion a year, which is actually more than a tenth of our country's annual GDP. It is well recognised that mental health and physical health are deeply connected. Our thoughts, moods and mental 
state may be abstract or separate from the physical, but in fact they are all happening as part of our brain activity. Many neuroscientists would argue that the brain is the most complex part of the body. Physiologists such as myself and Professor Patterson will agree there is a significant amount known about how the brain controls body functions. We know, for example, the centres of the brain responsible for controlling how we breathe and when the heart stops, how we control our movement, vision and speech. But there is still much we do not understand about the workings of the brain. Metabolic hormones such as insulin that regulate and control our blood sugar, cortisol that's increased during stress, and leptin that regulates hunger have been found to impact a wide range of mental illnesses such as ADHD, schizophrenia, and eating disorders. But likewise, certain mental health disorders can cause stress that triggers metabolic changes that induce these metabolic diseases. A number of studies have found that mental illness may accelerate biological aging, manifesting an increased rate of cardiovascular and other age-related diseases. We know that emotion can control our heart function. You may have heard of the widowhood effect, the increase in the probability of a person dying during a relatively short period of time after their long-time spouse or relative dies. It's particularly common in women, up to 80 or 90% are women, and you recall Debbie Reynolds, who died a day after hearing that her much-loved daughter Carrie Fisher had died. This phenomenon is called the broken heart syndrome, or Takotsubo syndrome, named by the Japanese in 1990, just for interest, Takotsubo is actually named after an octopus pot, which is the shape that the heart becomes when it develops this syndrome. Exactly what causes the syndrome is currently a scientific mystery. Researchers are trying to understand the interaction between the heart muscle and emotional signals in the brain. So there is no doubt that thoughts, feelings and beliefs can influence our biology for better or for worse. And it's been said that the brain is the source of all the qualities that define our humanity. So today we're going to hear a story about how the nervous system regulates the rhythm in the heart that was featured in a 2012 BBC4 television documentary. So now to our speaker. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Dave Patterson, who's <clears throat> the head of the Department of Physiology, Anatomy and Genetics at Oxford University and a physiologist. He is, though, as we call our Aussie New Zealander. He was born in New Zealand, but we claim him, <laughs> because he came to UWA and we gave him the opportunity with the Hackett Scholarship to go to Oxford University. <laughs> and, and from that, he, of course, completed a DPhil on chemoreception, winning the Rolleston Memorial Prize at Oxbridge. So he then went on to develop his career in uh, physiology and then in the, uh, has been physiology professor for more than 20 years and of course now the head of the department. He's also served as editor-in-chief of, chief of a number of journals, one of which I've had the delight of serving with him on, which was the Journal of Physiology in London. In my mind, one of the most enjoyable and most functional editorial boards have actually worked on. <laughs> <laughs> So today, though, the real reason why David's here is for us to celebrate his honorary doctorate. On Tuesday night at the evening graduation ceremony, he will receive an honorary doctorate from the University of Western Australia. So we're here to celebrate his honorary doctorate, but also to hear this wonderful talk that you can clap if you want. <laughs> really terrific to see so many familiar faces uh, in the audience, uh, old friends, and also one of my former students who was a medical student at Merton College, Jill Cowan, and there's another Mertonian just there, a musicologist, so it's a, it's a really small world, but I'm really delighted 
that uh, you could come and we can have a conversation about uh, of hearts and minds. I, I put up some of these quotes that some of you may be very familiar with. And I guess the, these are very much etched in mythology. And what I'm interested in, is there any neurobiological basis to these quotes, which is really what I'm going to talk about. We've known for a long time that um, the brain can affect the heart. And, and th this goes back centuries. And this is one of the early uh, quotes that I, I like to sh share with my medical students. This is from William Harvey. He was a very famous physician to Charles I during the English Civil War. And he's noted for discovering the circulation. He was warden of Merton College for a short time. And Harvey wrote, for every affection of the mind that is attended with either pain or pleasure, hope or fear, is the cause of an agitation whose influence extends to the heart. And the genius of the man is really here. This is 1628. This was long before the anatomy and the physiology of the autonomic nervous system had even been discovered. So Harvey had figured out that there was something going on in one's head that could affect one's heart. As Livia mentioned, uh, just over 10 years ago, uh, I was involved in a documentary about my research in Oxford uh, called Heart vs. Minds, What Makes Us Human? And I'd just like to pick out a couple of vignettes from this BBC documentary um, and then wind forward to where we are today in terms of what else have we learned about where we were almost uh, 10 years ago. Now, this diagram here, don't take too much notice of the detail, it's not important. I'm just kind of interested, how many people are in the humanities here? You can just put your hand up. And how many, how many medics are here? People in medicine. And general science? And just general interest. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to kind of picture that the general interest group. <laughs> because I'm still a bit jet lagged and <laughs> big sentences. So it's been known for a long time that the heart is wired into the brain. Let's not worry too much about the anatomical detail here. But what is quite interesting with, with this diagram, that in the heart itself, it's got its own intrinsic nervous system, or sometimes referred to as the heart's little brain. And very little is known about these neural circuits in the heart itself. They're mainly sensory, they're picking up information about the heart, what's going on, transmitting it back into the brain. Then the brain responds and sends other signals down to the heart. So there's some feedback neuromodulation loop that, that is going on there. Now I just like to put this into context, and I like to use sport because I'm in Australia, people relate to sports. So this is soccer, football for us in England. Some of you might remember this. This um, was just over 12 years ago. This is when the Bolton Wanderers midfielder, Fabrice Miamba, collapsed in an English Premiership game against Tottenham Hotspurs. And he had CPR performed on him for about 20 minutes. Luckily, there was a cardiologist in the audience in the stand who came down and resuscitated him. He didn't play any more football after this because uh, it was diagnosed he had a genetic inherited channelopathy, which is a mutation in the heart which was functionally expressed during stress. The stress in this case was high competitive sport. And you will see uh, newspaper articles on this occasion, even in Australia, where an apparently healthy man or woman is undertaking exertion and they collapse, sometimes sadly might die, hopefully they get resuscitated. But they're carrying this little time bomb in their heart which can be manifested. It is just not physical stress that can cause a cardiac event, also emotional stress can do this at the same time. So again, some of these sayings you may be familiar with, voodoo death, frightened to death, died of a broken heart, Livia touched on this. Voodoo death is very interesting because it depends on the culture that you come from. So voodoo death is uh, a death induced by changes in symbolism. 
So the witch doctor will come along and point the bone at you and say, okay, Glenn, you're going to die in 10 days' time. <laughs> Paul, your number is up in three weeks' time. Now, of course, in Australian culture, um, you don't believe that stuff, right? But there are some cultures that do believe that, and they can create a physiology almost to will themselves um, to death, which is interesting. So if I, you know, tonight when you leave here, if I was to say to you, okay, in the car park just outside, there are a couple of hungry tigers walking up and down. And you'd be thinking, what are the chances of tigers on Mounts Bay Road? Like, almost zero. So you're not going to get phased by that. But if I could convince you that there were tigers outside when you leave tonight, and I could do that, you know, if I hypnotized you all, which I can do, and I could get you to believe that there were tigers outside, now, even though the threat is symbolic, because there, there are no tigers outside, right? But if you could believe there are tigers outside, you would create a physiological stress phenotype on your body. Okay? And this is interesting. So whether the fear is real or symbolic can cause the same outcome. <clears throat> you may have seen um, these types of stories in newspapers, and Livia touched on this in her introduction. We, we call this broken, broken heart syndrome. So a Ohio couple married very happily for 17 years, uh, die 15 hours apart. Okay? This is called broken heart syndrome. And in medicine, the technical word for this is called Takasubu cardiac myopathy. So, as Livia mentioned, Takasubu named after the Japanese squid pot. So your heart balloons up, which is what you see over here. And of course, graphically, we'll just added to the effect of okay? broken heart syndrome. I just, you know, this is more common than you might think it is. Uh, I just picked out a study last week that was published in the European Heart Journal, and it's just a case report of a patient witnessing the death in hospital of his roommate. So two patients, one patient lying in bed, watched his roommate, Die. That event was stressful enough to cause the other roommate to have a takasubi, okay? big cardiac event. And we call this uh, a, bro a broken heart event. Now, what's interesting, in um, Oxford, about five years ago, we built the new West Wing of John Radcliffe Hospital, and we put the neurosurgical beds on the roof. So the patients had beautiful views out onto the Cotswolds. And the nurses had noticed that the patients who were recovering from their neurosurgery had bad cardiac outcomes. And they couldn't figure this out. The cardiologists came up. There were all these neurosurgical patients, some of them getting takasubus and lots of arrhythmia. And what they hadn't noticed was that as well as looking out at the beautiful views of the farmland, down below they could see a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> so you could imagine seeing the cemetery. They all thought they were in the departure lounge. <laughs> and the next checkout point was looking at them. And when the nurses switched the beds around the other way, so they couldn't see the cemetery anymore, all the symptoms got much better. Isn't that interesting, mm -hmm. seeing that? Because they had enough dwell time. And if you have enough dwell time, then you can get to the position of creating a situation which could become real for you, even though it's only symbolic. What's certainly interesting in this situation here is the notion of giving up. And when we train medical students, we spend most of our time teaching them how to fix a problem when it goes wrong. We never ask the question, what makes someone healthy? We don't ask that question. We fix the broken 
problem as doctors. Okay? And what's interesting here is that when you give up, so all of you have purpose in your life, you're here tonight, you have purpose when you get out of bed in the morning, and often you see this in gerontology when patients give up. And you may see this in your own families uh, and elderly relatives. They've had enough. Okay? And that's interesting because in doing so, they can invoke a physiological phenotype on their body. And I'm kind of interested in that, how that the cellular and molecular pathways remodel to cause, to cause that particular event. Now, one of the things that is, is kind of very interesting here is the notion of control. If you feel in control of the situation, your outcomes in life tend to be much better. In reality, even if you don't have a lot of control, but if you perceive to have control, then that can be a positive health benefit to your heart. For example, if you look at the data during the Second World War, during the D-Day landings, when the soldiers were storming the beaches of Normandy, there was unexplained sudden death in the landing craft of a number of soldiers. All of this information was suppressed due to the military nature of it. But if you go back into the medical records, you can document this. Interestingly, the threat was not symbolic, like the tiger. The threat was real because they could get machine gunned down on the beaches. Okay? The threat was real. What was interesting, if you looked at the fighter pilots during the Battle of Britain, their mortality rate was very high, statistically. Chances of dying around 40% during the peak part of the Battle of Britain. In fact, no Allied aircraft ever fell out of the sky unless it got shot down, meaning that the pilots were dropping dead inside their planes, but the soldier was dropping dead. So what's going on there? The reality is the pilot had worse outcomes. Four in 10 died, got shot down, okay? But the soldiers had a better outcome, and a worse outcome um, in terms of not being in control of the situation. So what was interesting, during the Battle of Britain, what the flight engineers found during the first phases of the Battle of Britain was that when the aircraft came back down, they noticed that there wasn't much damage to the planes. So they refueled them, rearmed them, and up they went again. And Churchill was saying, how come all the German bombers are still getting through to London? You know, there's something not right here. And when flight technicians put little Super 8 cam movie cameras on the machine guns, so every time the pilot hit the machine gun, the camera would start taking a movie. And of course, when the flight engineers played the movies back, what would you expect them to see? Shooting down an enemy aircraft. Yeah. And as soon as they put the cameras on the machine guns, the mortality rates rocketed it up amongst the pilots. Isn't that interesting? So what was probably happening in the early phases of the Battle of Britain, the pilots were exercising what we call optionality. That is, the soldier in the landing craft didn't have many options. It was a one-way ticket street that they had to go on. The pilot, of course, had options to engage or not. They could fly away fire their bullets into the clouds, come back down, say, yeah, that was a hard day at the office gulf, <coughs> load me up again, and off I go. Mortality went up when they were forced to engage. Human nature, okay? really, really interesting at that particular point. Let me go back to football again. <laughs> it makes the association between being in control and not being in control of one's life. Some of you may remember this. This is um, when Paul Ince missed the critical penalty when England were playing Argentina in the knockouts of the World Cup in 1998, and he missed. And when he missed, 
heart attacks in England went up 25%. 25% increase in heart attacks, but not in Scotland or Wales. <laughs> you guess who they were cheering for. And of course, a lot, a lot was riding on this match, right? Some of you will remember the um, geopolitical tension between Argentina and the United Kingdom over the Falklands. Yeah, it's not, not that long ago. Okay? So if you had skin in the game, that is, you're an English football supporter, then you're watching this, you've got no control over whether Paul Vince is going to hit the penalty or not. Okay? He missed, right? And your world collapsed, and 25% of people's world collapsed here, which is kind of interesting. So how do we study this? Interesting question. Hard to get volunteers <laughs> when the end point is death. Okay? So we've got to be a little bit smarter about it. So the way we tend to look at this is disease in a dish. Okay? Disease in a dish. And I only work on two two cells, right? Um, which is not too far from most of you, but uh, the two cells that I'm really interested in is a heart cell and a neuron. And this is a really simple analogy here. So the bomb is the bomb is the heart. The fuse is this the neuron. And if you end up igniting that fuse at the wrong time, then you will have big problems. You know, like some of the examples, anecdotes that, that I've just given you. There's also another way to study this, and this is kind of where we are at the moment. Um, this is a new big funded research program I'm about to start next year with colleagues in the United States um, and European colleagues. And we are at stage now of using small micro sensors or bioelectronic devices to implant them in your body for what we call neuromodulation therapy. So these, you ought, you, most of you would have heard of pacemakers and implantable defibrillators. So what we're looking at now are these small micro sensors that sit within the peripheral nervous system to give remote <coughs> stimulation of certain nerves to get that balance right in the system. And this might sound quite far-fetched because we've been working on this for 20 years, but we had actually identified the first targets in the brain about 22 years ago. And I remember talking to Medtronics about this, and they said, yeah, like it's a kind of a nice idea, but no one's going to come along and have a hole drilled in their head to have their blood pressure or their heart problems sort, sort after. And interestingly, Elon Musk is doing this exactly now. Okay? Musk is putting small micro sensors in the brain through telemetry and remote controlling excitation on different parts of the brain to affect the cardiovascular system. You know, we have it through deep brain stimulation electrodes, but we were always nervous about putting small micro sensors in the brain because if they start moving, you, know, you can't fish them out easily. But anyway, Musk has got a whole multi-billion dollar program looking at this at the moment. It's incredible what, what they're attempting to do. There will be some failures. Uh, look at SpaceX. Uh, there will be some failures on patients. We're, and in the UK, we're a lot more conservative about going for this, but I guess someone has to do it. So th this is kind of one approach, which you will now start seeing clinics, I think in probably five to 10 years time, with these small remote sensors that are put in different parts of your nervous system for target. We call this neurosutics or electrosutics. It's very similar to pharmaceutics, except there's no, there's no direct pharmacological medicine here. It's all tapping into the electricity of the system. And no, the notion here is that you can affect the end organ by targeting the, the nervous system. And the reason you might say, well, why is it taking so long to figure this out? And I think the reason it's probably taken a while is probably our fault, the way we train doctors. So like when Jill trained as a medical student at Merton College, you know, and if she wanted to be um, a cardiologist, then she'd study the heart. If she wanted to be a neurologist, she'd study the brain. 
and then you start to do that. Like you, you never bring them back again, which I think is, is a problem in medical education. Because you work as an integrated organism here. And the wiring connects up to all of these particular organs. So neuromodulation therapy is really quite popular now. Renal denervation has shown good efficacy for neurogenic hypertension. And some of this was first discovered in Australia, in, in Melbourne. If you denervate the kidney, then you can push the blood pressure down. The clinical data is very good on that. You can come along here if you've got uh, acute hypertension, maybe neurogenic hypertension, you can put uh, epidural anesthesia into the epidural space. You can stimulate dorsal gang root gang power stimulators. You can take the blood pressure down, take the pain down. You can stimulate the trachis in the air to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Or you can hit this ganglia here, which is the one that I'm particularly interested in. And this is the one that has the biggest clinical utility at the moment. So this particular nerve here is involved in all of this excitation and overwhelming responses. This is when you're stressed. This is when you're trying to avoid being eaten by the tiger. This is the guy or girl that is activated here. Yeah. Now, clinically, <coughs> what do we do with it? At the moment, you snip it out. Uh, you don't do this in Australia. Uh, the Americans do this, and some of the big hospitals in continental Europe do it. So, stelectomy, you've got two of these ganglia, and if you've got a very good vascular surgeon, it works quite well. But if you don't have a top-notch vascular surgeon, you can get a lot of complications with this because you've just got to get the cardiac branch of the static ganglia. And if you happen to take the wrong bits out, this nerve also has got innovation into the face. And so cosmetically, you can get sort of droopy eye facial expressions and lose that. We call it Horner syndrome. And this is a significant consequence of this particular intervention. But nevertheless, if you look at patients and you follow them up for a year and they're being stalactomized, this is a, a, a one-sided stalactomy versus a two-sided stalactomy. And this is plotting arrhythmic events with an implantable defibrillator going off and on. So these are patients that are, are vulnerable to sudden death. They've usually got some genetic abnormality and you're very worried about them. So you would implant an ICD. And you can see those that have been bilaterally stalactomized do pretty well. A lot of these patients get full of beta blockers, which you may have heard of, which block the adrenergic nervous system into the system. But young patients tend not to like these particular drugs because there's a lot of off-target effect of beta blockers and you get fatigue and they're not that compliant. They don't tend to like the stalactomy <coughs> either because they're worried about the cosmetic bit on the face. So there's little therapy around for younger patients that have these particular time bombs in them. And one of the approaches that we've taken in my group, and this is at the very basic research level, is using a combination of uh, stem cells and viral vector gene therapy, which you probably would have all heard about. So when you got your COVID vaccination shots, you would have, some of you may have got the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine here, I'm not sure. Hands up, we got the Oxford AstraZeneca. Yeah, the first one. yeah, okay, the first one, and then probably the Pfizer mRNA one is the second one. So the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is based on an adenovirus, okay? And these viruses are really good for transmitting information into the host genome, <coughs> uh, in this case, uh, against COVID. But in our case, we use it as a vehicle to get the gene of interest into the cells that we want to use. So that's how we use the gene therapy. But the difference here is what we're doing now, instead of working on rats and mice and dogs, we work on humans. But we take skin cells from the patient that's got a known genotype and phenotype. So we can take patients that we know have got a problem, we can take healthy patients as the control, we can take the skin cells and we can reprogram them back into their pluripotent state and then re-differentiate them into any cell type we like. And there was a Nobel Prize for this work um, about 10 years ago, which is a fantastic discovery. Um, John Gurdon from my university, uh, this was his doctoral thesis, 
1962, ended up creating this prize um, with uh, two Japanese scientists also shared the prize. <clears throat> so you can differentiate, differentiate these cells into any cell you like. And of course, in our case, we, we make heart cells and, and we make uh, neurons, which you can see there. And we can study them singularly or we can connect them up so they communicate to one another. And this is what we call disease in a dish. And by doing so, we can contextualize what happens to you in vivo. So we've got human cells that are personalized to the patient, which is neat. We can do that for the first time. And we can study this communication system of the neuron to the heart cell. And we can look for new target discovery in these cells, which is what we have been doing. This is for the scientists in the audience and the physiologists in the audience, but let's not worry too much about the detail in here. But over a number of years, using uh, bioinformatics and transcriptomics, we can pick up key target proteins that are involved in the release of these chemicals that make the heart be overexcited. <coughs> and this is called neurotransmission. And neurotransmission is highly dependent on calcium. Calcium is the key ion that facilitates the release of the chemical to make the heart get really excited. And there are a number of key proteins that are disrupted in disease that cause abnormal calcium homeostasis. And we can come along with our viral vector gene therapy. And instead of chopping out the nerve, we can just turn down the gain. So this is like the volume switch. This is the amplifier. That's the volume switch. Rather than chop it out, if you can just turn it down, because disease has turned the volume up too much on the volume switch. There's too much calcium in these neurons. And what we're trying to do is to regulate that, get it back to equilibrium. And by targeting these particular proteins, uh, we can do this and then change the behavior of the electrics that happens on the heart cell itself. So the particular disease I work on is one of these rare mutations, uh, and it's interesting because the hearts are structurally normal and the ECG is normal, so they're really hard to diagnose. <coughs> and the prevalence is about 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 10,000. So Western Australia, how many people? 2 million? 3 million? I don't know. The 2.8 million. Okay, let's, let's say 3 million for easy numbers. So you can do the maths on it, right? Or Australia's, what, 25, 30 million? you can see the prevalence is, is there. Long QT syndrome, which is the most dominant cardiac channelopathy, easy to diagnose because the QT interval, you can pick it up on the ECG. This one, way harder. Problem is with this, it's got an immensely high mortality rate in the under 40s. And often the first presentation is death. So this is the example of usually the sports person collapsing during the competitive event that takes place. Um, sometimes patients can present because they've got unexplained fainting or syncope. And if you've got a smart doctor, they may get to this diagnosis. That they've got this underlying cardiac problem that they actually go into a ventricular tachycardia and they fibrillate. But when they hit the ground, the impact of the ground defibrillates them. Okay? And they go back into sinus rhythm. <coughs> That's usually how they're found. Okay? And you can study these patients, and you have to genotype them to get the genetic linkage uh, as to why they've got problems. So th this, this is um, of, of interest, because we need to be able to kind of solve this, because it's devastating on, on families, this particular one. For the scientists in the room, <coughs> the mutation for this one is called CPBT1. So it's a gain of function mutation on the ryanodine receptor. So this channel stays open much longer. Calcium normally comes into the heart, activates proteins in the cytoplasm in particular, calcium-induced calcium release. Then what tends to happen, you, you need to get rid of that calcium after contraction is taking place for the heart to relax. So the calcium must get pumped out and sequestered back <coughs> to its internal stores. And one of the primary defending proteins you have to do this is the secondary active transport system called sodium calcium exchange. So what this is doing is, is importing three sodium ions and extruding one calcium ion. But it's going so flat out that the sodium pump can't get all the sodium out. So you get a net inward gain of sodium into the cell. And that brings in positive charge. And if you bring in positive charge to the cell, you'll end up depolarizing it 
before it's fully repolarized. And this is where you get these arrhythmic events taking place. So we're, we're kind of, this is the problem at the heart itself. And the question that we've been interested in, is this also a disease of the nervous system? That is, it's just not purely a disease of the heart itself. Um, and hopefully I'll give you an answer to this now, because this is unpublished, right? So you're, you're getting an early view of this uh, information. <coughs> so here's one of our patients, normal ECG, but look what happens when they exercise. You can see the morphology of the electrical activity is all over the place. Uh, these are polymorphic contracted <coughs> tachycardias, and if it degenerates into VF, then they will die unless they get defibrillated. So we, we can reprogram their cells, we can study their heart cells, we can study their neurons, we can put the two together, what actually happens. Now, <clears throat> this is not the prettiest of pictures, but actually this is what we see down the microscope. So the second with the little red circle around, that, uh, if your eyesight's good, but, uh, this is a heart cell. Then you've got neurons in the next panel, and then the next panel you've got the two cells growing together. But if we use high-end immunofluorescence, now we can get a lot more detail about what these cells are behaving like. <coughs> so these nice colored pictures here are fluorescing, and they've got all the right protein markers for us to be convinced that we've actually made heart cells, <coughs> then we've actually made neurons, and then if we put the two cells together, you can see the green lines here. These are the axons that are going down, making synaptic connections to the red cells, which are the heart cells. So we can get quite detailed anatomical representation. And then we can study the physiology of them. Um, first of all, at the macro level, structurally, we don't see anything different between the normal cells and the healthy cells, which kind of surprised us when we first looked at this, because in most cardiac disease, it's a structural problem followed by a functional problem. Doesn't mean that there's not an ultra structural problem. You know, you need electron microscopy to probably get in to look at it at that level. But just gross anatomy, there's no difference. If we measure the calcium inside the cell and the normal cells in blue, you know, they respond with an increase in calcium with the right stimulation. But in red, these are the diseased heart cells now. And you can just see how spontaneous the activity is taking place. This is kind of what we would, what we would expect. We haven't discovered that. This, this is already known. We've just recapitulated what's seen in the literature. So the diseased heart cells are all over the place when we mimic adrenergic stimulation or sympathetic stimulation. This is the new finding. Okay? This is the brand new finding. Meaning in red is the patient and blue is the healthy person. So you can see here, if we measure the calcium with fluorescence and we stimulate the cell, then you can see that in the patient they have very abnormally high increases in intracellular calcium transients. And calcium is the key link to neurotransmission. So enhanced calcium, more neurotransmission, more transmission onto the beta receptor in the heart, and then you get all that ugly calcium oscillation in the mast site, and then you get the arrhythmia. So this is what we're trying to fix. And we're trying to fix it by modulating key proteins in here that we know track to calcium. And this is kind of where we are at the moment. So model system, instead of targeting the heart itself, we're going upstream, one cell removed. And we want to turn down the excitability of that neural, turn, turn down the volume switch. Right, this was our Christmas dinner last <coughs> week. When was it? How was it? Tuesday, was it? Last Tuesday, last Wednesday at Merton College. Very nice event it was too. Um, this is my research group uh, in Oxford, but also uh, two of my uh, younger colleagues who I, I was their supervisor for their doctoral studies. So they were former students of mine, but one has now just become Professor of Cardiology at Oxford, Neil Herring. And Alex Green, uh, he's a neurosurgeon, and he's just now become Professor of Neurosurgery. So quite nice to see them do well. But I also quite like to show this slide too. 
Um, because what I've talked about is really built on decades <coughs> of work, not, not just two or three years' work. It's built on succession of trainees, graduate students, postdocs in the lab that each add to the knowledge base for the next generation to come in, which is why I kind of like on the shoulders we stand uh, from this particular group. And I started with a lot of quotations. Let me finish with a quotation too, because this again uh, was the quotation that uh, the producers put up in the BBC film at the end of the documentary uh, of heart versus mind, what makes us human. A good head and a good heart are always a form of combination. Thank you. So do we know, so if somebody's got had an MTBI and they've got dysautonomia, do we know um, if there are any increased risks subsequently of longer term cardiac events? Depends what type of dysautonomia that they've got. I think if you're looking at you know, primary cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. like post-MI, heart failure, hypertension, they're also associated with impairment of the autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. because they're just not cardiovascular diseases, they're also diseases of neurology as well. And interesting, one of the big powerful prognostic indicators for morbidity and mortality for sudden death um, is impaired sympathetic vagal balance mm -hmm. in the system. So the most powerful measure of outcome is heart rate recovery from exercise. So if you've got a very slow heart rate recovery, that's a negative prognostic indicator. If you've got a fast heart rate recovery from exercise, that's a positive prognostic indicator. So athletes will have fast heart rate recovery, sedentary people have slow heart rate recovery. And the reason for that is the sedentary person has got a poor vagus, and the vagus is nature's calcium <coughs> blocker, not for apnea. It's the vagus nerve, and that antagonizes the sympathetic nerve. And if you get a mismatch in that all along the balance, then that will affect um, morbidity going forward. The, the squid pot pathology that you, you mentioned, I'm sorry, I don't remember the... Takasubu. Thank you. Is that reversible? Yeah. If, you, if you remove the uh, initiating factors... Yeah. <coughs> yeah, but for some, but not everyone. For some, it is reversible. Usually, if you present with a Takasubu, the doctors will sort of fill you up with lots of beta blockers um, because it's a massive unloading of the adrenergic nervous system. In fact, the catecholamine levels are four to five times higher than what you'd see in a myocardial infarction. It's, it's incredible. M most most will spontaneously to recover, but not all, because sometimes if there's any underlying cardiac ischemia on the heart to start with, and you get that amount of sympathetic drive in the system, normally you pop them into an arrhythmia and they die. So, sorry, if so, if they don't want, don't recover, is that, is that inevitably fatal? Uh, yeah, usually, because they usually have arrhythmia. But if they're, in med if they're under the medical model very quickly, then pharmacologically they can be stabilised, whilst the heart structurally remodels back to its normal size again. Like typically, you know, I gave the example of a patient looking up on the cemetery bed. Uh, okay, they are very unwell, obviously. They're in a hospital mode, so therefore you think, okay, they're unwell anyway. But it can happen in very healthy people. Like another example we would give to medical students would be, for an example, a mother could be wearing uh, the pram along a uh, footpath with their young child and it loses control of the buggy 
and it goes onto the road and the dump truck comes along and squashes the baby. Okay, and the mother's there looking at this, okay? That would that would be a takasubu moment. Because you know the mother never recovers from that, really. You know, there's a whole lot of other therapy that you've got to go through, uh, you know, for a parent to lose a child like that. There's an, another example, in fact, is in, in Western Australia, uh, but it's got a happier ending, um, where there was a um, husband and wife had just bought a boat, a sailing boat, and they were out off Fremantle, zooming along, and they had their three-year-old kid in uh, a bungee, a little bungee, and the kid was bouncing up and down in the bungee, you know, zooming along in the boat, having a great time as it was getting dunked in the water up and down. The mother was staring at the boat, right? And dad was sort of working the bungee line with the kid. And the, the kid went down into the water and popped up again in this great big white pointer. <laughs> came straight up like that. And the dad hauled the kid back in. And the shark missed it by about that much. Oh. The mother had a taxubu. <laughs> <laughs> had to go and sell the boat, they never went sailing. <laughs> but that, that one ended well. But in fact, what, what the dad was doing was fly fishing. Oh. <laughs> was fly fishing with the child. <laughs> that, that, that's what was happening. Was fly fishing. <laughs> but that one ended well. <laughs> Please. Are you involved in any research or do you have any commentary on the impact of COVID on the heart and the mind? Uh, yeah, okay, so that's interesting. Um, COVID attacks the heart, we know that. COVID, first of all, uh, attacks the nervous system <coughs> and as well as attacking the lungs because it's an oxygen problem in the end for patients that don't survive COVID. Uh, you know, you get massive vasodilatation and they go into end organ failure. So it's a cardiovascular problem at the end, but like, also like septic shock, very similar. But yeah, COVID does attack the nervous system and there's lots of studies. And we think this could be important in the syndrome. I'm not sure, you, have you heard of long COVID? Yes. Yeah, so the, the notion of long COVID uh, comes into the nervous system and it remodels your ability for breathing. So you get breathless, you're always feeling fatigued, um, any bit of exercise that you do, even if it's walking, you'll get palpitations. And this virus, because it's a retrovirus, it's still inserted into the genome. Uh, and they, these patients haven't cleared that virus from their body sufficiently or mounted an immune response to adapt to that virus, which most people do. But, but not everyone does. There are a small percentage of patients that will have residual effects where the virus is still attacking their nervous system. And it's still in the infancy of trying to figure out how to deal with that. I think often the first thing is getting the diagnosis right to start with and acknowledging there's a problem and it's not psychosomatic, which some doctors think it is, which it's not. You know, it's a real organic problem that patients have. David, um, I want to ask a question. Um, as, the, as your host, I'm I'll, I'll take advantage of it and ask you a question, but um, thank you so much. That was amazing. You took us on an incredible journey. My own research looks at um, the rise of political partisanship, and I spent 12 months in the US interviewing um, Republican, like looking at the future of the Republican Party. And I was really taken by your statement about control um, and people's health when it comes to control. And what we've seen in the US is a, a rise of deaths in controllable diseases, you know, drug addiction, alcohol, um, a whole bunch of things, you know, towns where mining, you know, mines close down and they spiral out of control and so on. Um, I mean, have you touched on the sort of the, these, have, do you know much about research or have you touched on these kinds of external factors and how that, you know, we talked about loved ones, but what about that sense of, you know, losing control of your neighborhood or seeing your community collapse or you know spiral out of control have you, have you had a chance to reflect on that yeah i read about this i don't, I don't study this i've got an opinion like we all have an opinion on this because this is more sociological i'll just give you my opinion it's just an opinion but i think if you have if you have neighborhoods that don't feel empowered if you have people that don't feel empowered 
that they feel they've got no control over their environment, then their health is affected. You know, that's why there's a very high correlation between patients with mental illness and chronic depression and cardiovascular morbidity. You know, and there are organic reasons for that possibly, but there are also sociological reasons too. So, you know, often I tend to say, if someone's very adamant about something, um, I always kind of take a little step back, because I'm always curious to know what, um, what makes you sure you're so right? Okay? What makes you sure you're so right? Because you could be wrong. Okay? You could be wrong. And that could have a big public health outcome if you're wrong, even the possibility. So you would have had all the debates and arguments about do I take the vaccine, don't I take the vaccine? Because mm -hmm. right? we've just been through a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And you would hear all this information and then the doctors are saying, yeah, take the vaccine. And then you got another group that said, no, 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 it's all, it's all hocus pocus conspiracy. And da, 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 da. Okay, now I, I'm on the medical side, so I, like, I love the vaccine because my university helped develop it, <laughs> the first one anyway. So my line is, well, yeah, if, if, you know, if, if, you, if you want to get blood clots, you know, uh, get catch COVID. You know, you'll get blood clots, all right. You know, the, the the minor chances of getting a blood clot with the vaccine is tiny, like one in nine hundred thousand. You know, the oral contraceptive is about what, one in four hundred for getting a clot. Okay, like, and people on the whole don't understand risk, material risk. It's like, you know, what's the chance of getting eaten by a shark? Well. Not that high. Unless you fly fishing. So I think it's like going, and you, you, you saw this in the United States, like some states had worse mortality than other states because some states, mainly the Republican states, were anti vaxxers mm -hmm. And the death toll was incredible in those states compared to the other states, which were more Democrat driven, who looked at the evidence, looked at the science, and, and, and took vaccinations, and they, they had a much better outcome. The UK, we were kind of somewhere in the middle of that because it's that difficulty between freedom and choice. And I'm sure you have the same debates in Australia, but the virus doesn't care about the Magna Carta, okay? It doesn't care about the Magna Carta, about civil liberties, right? The virus is the virus. And luckily, and this one was bad, but it could be much worse. Because the, guess what the average death age was in the United Kingdom? The average death age. 82. 82. Wow. It was 82. Right? What's life expectancy in the UK? 78. <laughs> Late 70s, depending on your postcode. Right? So that was never, like when Boris Johnson was trying to work out the public policy because this is a tough one like and you know you can see this in the UK inquiry at the moment where flippantly is alleged that he said which is probably true well you know they're going to die anyway type stuff but you know there's no votes in killing of all grandparents in the country essentially but if you position it in terms of where the morbidity and mortality was you know it was in the elderly and those with comorbidities like if you're immunosuppressed so that that's the group that needed protecting ASAP, the group that's most vulnerable. 80% of the people were asymptomatic with COVID. You had it, but you didn't know you had it. But you were vectors of transmission to vulnerable groups. But if 12 year olds were dying, like 80 year olds, your whole public health policy would be completely different in terms of how you would respond if 12 year olds were succumbing. Okay? So we'll get another one, not if, but when type stuff. But how social policy deals with this, I think. It's going to be really important because we've already got the real data in certain countries sitting there, don't we? Around. Alan, do you Thanks, Dave. So the potential for neuropopulation, I think, is quite intriguing. And, you know, the transcranial electrical stimulation is great for treating depression and mental illness. So what about improving cardiac status? So, you know, there are these headphones. I've actually got a set which improves athletic performance supposedly yeah. so it improves your you know cardiac fitness and parameters. What's the mechanism for that? I don't know that. I can only so what is it? They you're getting they stimulation get through get so it's tracker stimulation, is it? So it'll be vagal stimulation, is it? Well apparently <laughs> if you put the headphones on yeah. certain parts of your head, right. um, then you get the transcranial electrical stimulation yeah. of I've tried it, but we 
sich, so weiss ich meine, ich meine, ich bin patients like the, you know you're really unwell the doctor arrives then the patient perks up mm -hmm. yeah. because they've got some, you know now they can take away the responsibility of their illness and give it to the doctor <laughs> you fix me please okay and they get better like isn't that interesting like you kind of perk up so this is when i get back to this notion of being in control it's like the pilots the pilots are under huge pressure like mortality rate of 40 percent you know 10 sortings you know, like 40% chance of, of not coming back, but they weren't dropping dead due to that stress, whereas the poor old soldier was on a one-way event up, up, the, up the cliffs, right, and, and got frightened to death, frightened to death in the system. Then I, I think I might have uh, lost it partway through, where I think you were talking about the viral vector you know, delivery to change the genetics of the uh, cell. And then you were talking about later on um, electrical earlier electrostimulation, and you're trying to do a change in the calcium balance in the heart through the channel that you don't identify. So, is it going to be a pharmacological intervention? Is it going to be electrostimulation? A little bit like Alan asked. Or could it be visual, other sense, sensory stimulations where you don't have to get into all that? Are there possibilities of just changing the whole picture? Yeah, well, just with cognitive therapy, you know, if you can change the perception and reality, you know, and even symbolically, can, can you change the outcome? This is the power, you know, we know this with meditation, don't we? And with people that undertake that, just the power to alter that neural balance, and, and that can be done. That's, that's been done for a long time. For that to get clinical utility, and cognitive therapy works really well with certain disorders. For it to work for a cardiac disorder, don't know. You'd have to probably run the experiment. But the well-being experiment, which is what you're suggesting, given the placebo thing, then I think there's a lot to that. You know, we're trying to fix something that's organic and a bit patient that we know that there's a protein that's broken that leads to downstream biochemical cascade. But we're, we need to fix that. I think you could do as much meditation as you like. You're not going to fix that problem. You need to structurally go in there and change it. Now, at the moment, it's a bioengineering problem, which is all the little micro sensors and what Elon Musk is doing. Um, although we're doing it in the peripheral nervous system, we're not going into the brain. It's too dangerous for us to do that. The other bit at the end was the gene therapy using the cells to identify a target, which is more of a traditional biomedical approach that you would go to targeted therapy, you know, like a vaccine, for example. So this, this is what we would be trying to do for rare inherited diseases. Can I just quickly ask you, um, you talked initially about, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You talked initially about what makes it healthy, right? Yeah, yeah. So what, what is your research telling us about human connection and how seeing your fellow friends, your everyone around you yeah. healthy makes you healthy as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's, that's a good comment and a good observation because we're social beings. Look at the way we live in communities. Look at the way we build our houses. We have neighbours. You know, we naturally interact for our own chemistry with people. And COVID, good example lockdowns, right? You didn't get to see people for a long time, often, and we're only now seeing the morbidity of that mental health outcome taking place in communities now. So the question is, what makes us healthy? Like, and it's good to think about that when you leave here. Like, what makes you get out of bed in the morning? Like, oh, you don't ask that question. It's not because the alarm clock goes off and you've got to go and make a cappuccino. 